Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. To join our community, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and receive these five free benefits. First, you get the risk reduction checklist I've created from the lessons I've learned from all my guests. Second, you get my weekly email to help you increase your investment return. Third, you get a 25% discount on all A Stotts Academy courses. Fourth, you get access to our Facebook community to get to know guests and fellow listeners. And finally, you get my curated list of the top 10 podcast episodes. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A Stotts Academy. And I'm here with featured guests, Michael Marr. Michael, are you ready to rock? I am ready. I'm ready to go. Yeah, in fact, you just set, told me that you just finish your workout. So you must be pumped up. That's right. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm, I'm raging out. Yeah. All right. Well, let me in rage and Roy. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let's do this. I'm going to tell the audience a little bit about you. Michael Marr is a musician turned business owner. Yes. He once dreamed of being a rock star and he even dropped out of college to pursue that dream. But then reality set in. Now Michael runs his own Amazon managed services agency called Cartology, and he loves it. He spends his time helping his clients translate their brand story into highly engaging product listings and artfully utilize Amazon's advertising platform to insert their brand into the conversations consumers are having with them. Michael, take a minute and fill any further tidbits about your life. Yeah, I, uh, I get to work with a totally remote team um, spread out across the world from the Philippines, US, Europe. Um, we, we started that way four years ago and we really get to, majority of the products that you buy on Amazon are not from Amazon. And so we get to work with brands um, that and really take the core of their brand and turn it into something that will generate sales for them, creating a sustainable channel and ultimately getting them profitable. There's a lot of talk about, you know, seven figure, eight figure businesses. And for me, it's really about, you know, long term playing the long game and what can you take home at the end of the day? Um, that to me is, is where the success really is for brands. You know, I'm so interested in Amazon. So I got a couple of questions for you. You know, there's two types of people that I want you to think about. You know, one type of person is me. I got a few books. I have four books or so, five books on Amazon. And, um, you know, I just self-published. Some of them are doing better than others. You know, I did one that's a free book, uh, you know, to try to kind of see what's, what the downloads are like. I've never, I felt like, Advertising is just daunting. I don't understand anything about advertising on Amazon, so I never really did it. And then I would like for you to think about that man or woman who's listening who doesn't have anything on Amazon. And, you know, let's try to think, should they? What is the power of Amazon? So I'm just curious from your experience, how would you help myself and the listeners think about Amazon from those two different perspectives? I love how you set that up, and I think a lot of brands have this mentality of, you know, there's $346 billion of revenue that Amazon generates. And it's like, how do we tap into that? And it's, it's exciting, but it is also very daunting because it's so big and it, countless people that we consult with say, Hey, I went in, I opened an account and I tried to do this. And then I just stopped because I had no idea what I was doing. And that doesn't surprise me at all because over the past decade or so from when I started selling, I started as a seller and turned into a, you know, agency owner, uh, the platform's changed a ton. And I think the, the thing that's most important for someone, whether it's an author, and we've worked with several authors, um, if it's someone who's thinking about starting a business on Amazon, it's all about framing expectations. Some people are gonna say, it's content, it's advertising, it's all this stuff. Yes, those are components of it, but it's, the thought process of how you go into it that's going to determine whether you can make this work or not. And so when I when I speak about expectations, there there are plenty of opportunities on Amazon, but it's how I think it's ultimately how patient can you be? If you're able to start something small, grow it over time, potentially with help or even figuring it out on your own, 
while you're working another job, that's something that in a couple of years that could really be something, but you have to be patient. And I think a lot of people want to get the big sales and get money in their bank account. And the truth of the matter is to get really big sales initially, it requires a lot of capital, but you don't have to go into Amazon that way. So if you're thinking about how can I get into Amazon, it just starts with an idea. It starts with a product idea that turns into some more research, plenty of tools out there to, to analyze the Amazon landscape. Uh, and then that idea that you've researched then turns into, you know, the process of, do I really want to do this? And, and something that we, I just consulted with a brand earlier today, one of our clients, we we're just talking big picture. And I said, you know, one of the keys to Amazon is being able to sell something repeatedly. So it's not autopilot, but you want, if someone likes something, you want to continue to give that product to people. Mm -hmm. And there, there are a lot of, I would say, fashion brands that really rely upon seasonal stuff. And there's a shift of thinking that has to happen. So really, it's, to me, it's just about expectations. What are your expectations going in? You can be satisfied and successful if you frame it right. Right. And uh, what, just for the listeners out there, what is your kind of ideal client? So that if, if anybody's listening and they, they need help or they want help, what would you describe as your ideal client? Sure. Well, I'll throw out there that regardless of who you are, feel free to connect with me. I'm happy to, to put you in the right, um, send you off in the right direction or put you in touch with someone if, I, if you're not my ideal client. And I know who that is. So I'm happy to give away information to people because I've had plenty of people that have, have built into me. Um, so that's number one. And uh, in terms of ideal clients, there, there are three sellers, three types of sellers on Amazon. There are the resellers. That's how I started. Uh, some people will do what they call retail arbitrage. They'll go buy something at a discount, sell it, sell it on Amazon. Then we have the um, private label people. And those are people who aren't really creating a new product. They're just taking an existing product, slapping their brand on it, and then selling it because they notice, oh, there's, there's a need for this in the market. And then there are brands, legitimate brands who they have a brand story. They have a very defined product. That product has a very distinct use. That's who we're working with are those brands. Um, and, and then from there, you know, if we're going to quantify things a little bit, we're looking for brands that, you know, have, it, have an established brand. They could be a newer brand, but as long as they have a brand story that's legitimate, then we will, we, we will work with them. Um, and typically we're looking for brands that overall, you know, they could have their own e-commerce store. They could be in brick and mortar. They could even be selling on Amazon and just not getting the results they want. But overall, they're typically doing anywhere from, you know, one to maybe 20 or 30 million total revenue for the year. Mm. And one question, my last question related to Amazon is just the, uh, to what extent does Amazon give you the space to tell your brand story for that type of client? There's, Amazon's very, I would say, strict about, you know, you can't change how the page looks, but they give you opportunities on your product listing and, and other opportunities as well uh, to, to tell the brand story. And so I think it's about really utilizing that space well. If mm -hmm. you've got, Im if you get, you know, seven images uh, plus a video and you're not taking advantage of all that, you're losing sales. If you're not, um, if you're not able to, uh, you know, take that video and then go and advertise with it, you're losing sales. So mm. um, I'd say plenty of opportunity. Are you really doing a good job of telling that in that space? Right. Got it. You're having an elevator pitch. You, you got to know what your, what your quick pitch is to, to get in the door. Hmm. Well, it's uh, great to learn from an expert. I appreciate that. And for the listeners out there, you know, um, feel free to reach out to Michael. I know uh, he's mentioned that already. And he and I talked earlier about, LinkedIn being a great way to, to reach out as well as you can come to the show notes and uh, click on the show notes and then you can go to contact Michael. Well, speaking of brand story, now it's time to share your worst investment ever. That's kind of my brand story. And, yeah. <laughs> and since no one ever goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it and tell us your story. Yeah, I like your brand story. Part of the reason I like it is because it's a challenge. And I love a good challenge. So I, I love, I appreciate the opportunity to just come on the show and, and be honest and talk about something that I, could feel like a failure, but I think was ultimately a great learning experience for me. Um, so I started selling back in 2010. I was working a job that I hated, um, was able to 
build an e-commerce business for a year while I was working this other job and I finally quit the other job in, into entrepreneurship full time, was able to launch on multiple channels, eBay, Amazon, um, Sears has a marketplace, believe it or not, not very successful. Um, apparently it's still running. And I had a couple of brands that I created as well. And I was not a trained business person. I didn't go to business school. My degree in college was actually Asian studies. Hmm. Um, so very, I just took Japanese for a long time and I thought, how can I get out of college? I want to get out as quickly as possible because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I built this business up really not knowing, I, I knew what a P&L was, no idea what a balance sheet was when I first started. I thought I had a friend who was an accountant who helped me get started. He had started his own e-commerce business and he was explaining double entry accounting. I'm like, wait, 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 the money's here. Why would you take it out and put it over here? That doesn't make any sense. No, I want the money here. And eventually I learned, I asked for help and, and got help from people. But this specific situation that I'm thinking of, I, I just remember having this desire to grow my business and almost being desperate to, to do so, to, to whatever means possible. I had this idea of what I think success looked like. And um, the success of my business was very closely tied to my self-worth. Mm -hmm. So if my business wasn't succeeding, I, I wasn't succeeding. And during this time period, you know, I was a couple of years into my, several years into my business and I just didn't have the cash that I needed on hand. It was tied up on credit cards. It was tied up in inventory. It was tied up in uh, paying myself and paying other people. And so at the time, there was an immense pressure upon me to, that I really placed upon myself uh, to, to get my business to perform. And I didn't really, I didn't have other entrepreneurs that I was really connecting with. Uh, I didn't really share some with my wife because I thought I needed to carry this on my own. It wasn't something that I needed to bother her with. And in this moment, I was like, I need to get extra money. So how am I going to do that? So I just start researching places to get money. And of course, the easiest places to get money are cash advance places, merchant, merchant cash advances, um, pl plenty of companies out there. Some I've worked with um, and I'm still getting calls to this day uh, about uh, text and text messages even about, do you need this line of credit? Um, and I started getting a little interesting with some of those, um, you know, coming up with crazy stories like, yes, I, I need capital. I'm running an e-commerce taxidermy store and I really need, we're getting a big demand for mooses and we just don't have the money. That was a, an actual story that I came up with, but um, I just, I started searching around for, for different, you know, merchant cash advances places, cash advance places and I went ahead and, and locked in on one. And I mean, it was a terrible deal, uh, monthly payments paying back. It was not a large sum of money, maybe $14,000. Um, I mean, you know, large from a business standpoint, it could be mm. you know, large personally, but I uh, remember having to pay monthly payments, uh, tons of interest. I mean, just basically paying interest all up front. And the amount of money that was given to you was even cut short because there was a fee. So even if you were getting 14 grand, it was more like, you know, 12, eight or something like that. So I mean, just, just awful. And I, I remember getting all the paperwork in, to, in order, really being excited about this new opportunity. And I was a little apprehensive, but I felt like I had done my research in terms of finding the right person. What I didn't do the research on was the actual deal itself. And I didn't consult with anyone, um, maybe even instinctually because I thought people are going to tell me no, and I want to do this and I want to be um, so that led up to me signing the document um, and, and getting the cash advance. And it was the day after that I realized, oh my gosh, I made a huge mistake. And what was it that made you think you made a huge mistake? I looked at the, the terms and it was, you know, I think like $800 a week that I was supposed to pay back but it was for like a decade. I mean, it was, a, I mean, it was just awful. Um, if you're out there, just don't do it. It's not worth it. It's not, you know, ride it out is the best thing I could say. Um, don't, don't go through with it. And that, and that was just looking at that. I realized, oh my gosh, I made this big mistake. I need did to you tell you, did you tell your wife? Um, I eventually told my wife. Right. But on and, that day, um, I don't, I don't know. I think maybe I told her later that day, yeah. once I had finally realized it, it wasn't that I wanted to 
withhold from her. And of course, as a um, being married for almost 13 years and being an entrepreneur for 11, uh, I've learned to communicate better and that I mm. need to be very open and share stuff. And so now, you know, finances for my business, I'm something I talk about with my wife often. She's very clued into that. And um, I, I just felt like I had to carry the weight myself. I had, I'm like, I, I got to be strong. I got to, you know, be an entrepreneur. I got to get out there and, and do it and make this happen. And before we talk about the lessons that you learned, just give us some idea of how you dealt with that, you know, over the, you know, the next years or whatever it took to get through that. Yeah. So I ended up, um, I, I, I knew I had made a mistake and I ended up uh, calling my mom and I said, I made a big mistake. I need help. And I remember exactly where it was, where we went and got coffee and she was, and my parents are incredibly loving and supportive. Um, they've always told me to go out and do what I wanted to do. Um, you know, and of course, go, go the direction that, um, you know, you feel called. And my, my dad made some interesting decisions. He was in his mid thirties mm -hmm. and was a biochemist and said, Hey, I'm feeling like God's calling me to go be a, a, a physician. And he had a seven, a five and a three-year-old. My mom's like, are you sure? He's like, yes, this is it. Definitely the right direction for him. But they were also very encouraging. And so um, I ended up, you know, going to them and, and they helped me to, to get out of this. But I think the biggest, it still was a mess. Mm -hmm. And the biggest lesson that I really learned out of this is that sometimes you can't get out of your own crap. You're just stuck in it. And sometimes you have to sit in that. And instead of going and getting capital, if I had looked at what I was, what I was doing and where the problem was, I probably could have diagnosed it a lot easier and made some adjustments, made some changes. I could have said, Hey, I'm not going to pay myself for a couple months mm -hmm. and I'm going to see if I can get that money to go back into the business. To There's so many different things I could have done. And I've done that before. You know, I, I've had to make sacrifices before, but it really was just, instead of trying to find a solution and acting so quickly, if I would have really thought about it and just taken my time, um, I think when you know you're supposed to act, get out there and act. But when you don't know and you aren't sure, you need to wait and you need to, uh, to, to sometimes just listen. To what, what is the direction that you need to go? What is the, um, the way that I need to go? And so that, that was probably the biggest thing that I got out of that. And also just money doesn't solve problems. <laughs> that was another big lesson too. Yeah. Well, let me summarize a few things that I took away. Um, you kind of reminded me of this um, situation. I was back in the US visiting my sister and she was in a pretty bad relationship and she and I took a trip to go see my mom and dad down in North Carolina. So we drove and I, I'm a Civil War buff. So I, we went from uh, from Maine to, uh, or let's say maybe it was maybe it was New York or Boston to North Carolina. And we went and we went to oh, wow. Gettys Gettysburg and then we went down, um, you know, through the Shenandoah Valley to re re you know, go through the Stonewall Jackson's, crew, you know, campaigns in the valley and all that. But she was in such a bad situation. And we, we had a saying that we kind of came up with. And that is, when you're in the shit, don't splash around a lot. Yes, that's it. When you're in the <laughs> shit, don't splash around a lot. That is exactly it. Sometimes you just have to sit and, and wait. And I mean, the, the, I guess the way that I look at it is, I always felt I had to take action to do something. And, and honestly, in, in the period of my business, basically the e-commerce side going downhill, that led to me creating my agency. And it was in there that I had to sit in the shit and not splash around a bunch and just say, all right, like, God, I tried, I tried to do things. What is it that I'm supposed to do? I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing the direction. And it was in there that I ultimately discovered how to get through it. But it, I mean, it really took stinking for a while. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, part of that other lesson from that is that, you know, sometimes things happen quickly and sometimes they happen slowly. And particularly in business, small business, sometimes it's a trap. You know, it, it's hard to move forward and you can't really move back. I think when we were in a really tough time with my coffee business here in Thailand where we have a factory, it was really, we were in the middle of a 1997 economic crisis. And we didn't see a way out of getting revenue coming for the next year or so. I mean, we didn't have the budget to hire salespeople. And even if we did, we weren't convinced 
that we would get much. And we couldn't go back. In other words, nobody's buying a, this factory. And there was certainly anybody that would buy it would buy it for 10 cents on the dollar. And, yeah. you know, we'd get nothing. So sometimes, you know, you're just kind of stuck in the shit and you just got to plod along through it. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wrote down is, you know, it's, it's lonely at the top. And, you know, it's something that we always say, you know, about big CEOs and all that. But the truth is, when you're an entrepreneur, it can be very lonely, you know, and you, you don't want to share, you know, it, how comfortable would anybody be if the owner of a business comes in and shares the feeling that they had at 2 a.m. last night when they said, it's all going to collapse in and I won't be able to pay anybody's salaries. You know, if you walk in yeah. with that fear that you probably wake up at 2 a.m., you know, every now and then. Uh, and you share that with your team, you know, that just doesn't help. And so you're naturally forced. And then, you know, you bring in the, the element of, of the wife and family and all that. And then it just brings in a lot. And so that takes me to the third thing that I wrote down. And that is, you know, when you face challenge, you need to explore all the options. And the best way to do that is to find someone that you trust and sit down and talk about it, slow down. And, you know, someone that doesn't mind that you stink a little bit right now. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, then just kind of go through. Thing. Yeah. Anything you would add to that? No, I, I think the, the community piece is something that I learned as an entrepreneur. Um, I Once I found community, I felt so much more enriched. And my problems didn't go away. But I had other people that I could talk to about them. I had other people that I could use as resources. Um, I, I learned to ask for help more. I need help. And mm -hmm. as my business is growing and succeeding now, I have a growing profitable business, which I'm very, very thankful for, not without its challenges. Um, going through some, some interesting stuff right now, some change up with team members and, and what that looks like and services we're providing to people, how we're delivering that. And I've been able to, to talk with people about it. I've reached out and said, hey, I need your help with this. Um, I've hired coaches to help me. To I hired a coach last year to help me build out a sales channel uh, build out a pipeline, determine what that's going to look like and be a better salesperson because I didn't really have a ton of experience doing that. And it's changed my world. And so I think, mm -hmm. you know, having someone that you trust and can consult with is huge, finding community and just ask for help. People want, people want to help. And if the, someone said, what's the worst they could say? No, I hate you. I don't ever want to see you again. Okay. Well, they, how good of a friend were they if they, yeah, <laughs> if exactly. they couldn't just turn you Glad down? Glad to know that. Yeah. No, I That's think very that, helpful. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. I will yeah. be on my way now. Or as a, a friend of mine used to say, fuck you very much. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, exact, that's exactly it, yeah. <laughs> so based upon what you learned from this story, and I want you to think about that young man or woman out there that is kind of feeling, you know, stuck in the middle and, you know, wants to go forward. What, and, and think about what you've learned over these years. What one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? I think the, the first thing, there, there are a couple of things that are very related, but the first thing would be it, it, work is, it can be very stressful, especially as an entrepreneur, if you've got your own business, take a step away from that. It's, it's the, the shit that's there is going to be there. Okay. Mm. So take a step away, take a breather, pause, maybe take a day, and, and go and, and sit in a park and journal or uh, walk around, think, talk out loud, pray, whatever it is that you, that you want to do, and just try to, to gather yourself and don't act out of the, the, the fear that, that's very palpable, but that's there. Don't, don't act out of that initially. And then I would say, go and find someone who you trust, very similar to what you said, Andrew, mm -hmm. go and find someone that you trust and be honest with them and say, you know, what should I do? Ask for their help and listen. Don't just ask for help. There's nothing worse than when my daughter's like, what should I do? Should I do this or that? And I say, yeah, do this. And she goes and does that. I'm like, why do you even ask me? <laughs> listen to what they say if you trust them and, and, and then take the time to think about it. You know, any, any financial problem that I've had, it's it, any, any issue that I've had, it never had to be solved right away. Mm -hmm. There was always time to figure it out, but I didn't notice that in the moment because I was so panicked on trying to fix it. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just writing down, take the time. Yeah, absolutely. Take the take time, the time. To, to figure it out. Um, so last question, what's your number one goal for the next 12 months? 
my number one goal is to, it's for growth in my agency, but I would say more than just growth, the, the goal for us is to serve people at a really high level, to really help those brands to, to excel. And so I want to be able to help more people. Um, and I want to be able to grow the business that way, take on uh, more team members as needed, pay my team more for certain things, add, you know, different incentives. Mm -hmm. So the goal is for really us to, to double our, our clients. We've got about 10 right now. We're very intentional about who we take on. So we're looking to double that. Um, if we do that properly, we can hit a really, um, a really high sales goal that we have. And in that, I also want to be able to, in the podcast that I release and in the the blog that I have in the content I put out on LinkedIn, I really want to be able to be a tr seen as a trusted source of information. And not just because it's a lead magnet. Yes, my podcast could help bring people in. Yes, the blog can help bring people in. But I want people to see that our real honest growth tagline is true. We want to help people create real honest growth. We're not about, if it's quick, cool, but it's not always going to be that way. And so I really want to be seen as a trusted source as we as we grow the business so that people say, hey, I I believe what this guy's saying and he's actually helped me. Tell the audience about your blog and your podcast just so that they know what they can expect and go there. Yep. So our blog uh, for my business is at thinkcartology.com. Um, when you have a problem with Amazon, think Cartology. Cartology.com was taken. So what are you going to mm -hmm. do? And uh, it's just blogs right there, top of the page, um, more stuff to come. There's one post right now, more to come. Mm. Uh, and then I'm launching a podcast over the next couple months called The Longer Game. Um, and you'll be able to find a landing page at thelongergame.com. And the whole goal of that is talking about the future of retail. What is retail going to look like over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Uh, how has Amazon changed the game with that? What is brick and mortar going to look like? Um, I'm going to bring on a lot of different people. It's not going to be super only Amazon focused, not only e-commerce. I want to talk about retail. I want to talk about malls closing. I want to talk about everything and what is it going to look like in the future so people can, uh, brands and consumers can say, hey, that I like that. Or I think, yeah, that would be cool. Or maybe imagine what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. My number one goal for the next 12 months is to help you, my listener, to reduce risk an increased return in your life. To achieve this, I've created our community at myworstinvestmentever.com and I look forward to seeing you there. As we conclude, Michael, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Just take the time, people. Take, take the, the time. time. Beautiful. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.